Hey, welcome once again to The Journey Church. I'm Carrick Thomas, lead pastor here at The Journey New York City. And I want to thank you for joining me today, whether this is your first time ever at church online or whether you call The Journey New York City uh, your home, or if you're joining us today from South Florida, from our Journey Boca Raton uh, location. Now, you know, The Journey is one church that meets in multiple locations. And so I always love it when we're able to meet together at church online. I want to thank Pastor Jason for letting me jump in and uh, teach in uh, Journey Boca Boca today while he's on vacation. So listen, wherever you're joining us uh, from for today's service, you made a great decision to be here because today we're continuing our God on Film teaching series where we're looking at the spiritual meaning behind some of the biggest uh, movies of the summer. And today we're looking at the romantic comedy, Fly Me to the Moon, so that we can discover the truth about love. And so if you haven't yet, take a moment, click that button beside the live stream player, download your message notes so you can use those to take notes and follow along during the message today. Now, as you do that, this new romantic comedy, Fly Me to the Moon, is set in 1969. And it follows the story of a young woman named Kelly, who's a, a marketing strategist, and a young guy named Cole, who, who is a launch director for NASA. And they are tasked with protecting the image of NASA in the United States as we race the Soviets to get the first man on the moon. And so here's what they asked them to do. They asked Kelly and cold to stage a fake moon landing as a plan B. So as the United States tries to land someone on the moon before the Soviet Union does, they're behind the scenes creating a fake moon landing in case everything doesn't work. Now, this is a romantic comedy, so of course there's love in the air. And as all the chaos ensues as they try to create this fake moon landing, Cole and Kelly also fall in love with one another. Now, love. Now, that's, love is a word that we throw around quite often, and we know that love is important. I mean, after all, it's at the core of every romantic comedy that, that we've ever seen. But do we really know what love truly is? I mean, if I were to ask you to define love, what would you say? I mean, th since we learned so much about love from the movies, and since this is a God on Film teaching series, maybe, maybe we could take some famous quotes from, from uh, famous movies about love, and that could help us define what love really is. See, see if any of these help. How about this line? You complete me. Do you remember what movie that's from? Yeah, of course, that's uh, Tom Cruise from Jerry Maguire. You complete me, which is all wrong because there is not another person in the world that can complete you because you've got a God-shaped hole in your life. There's an emptiness within you that only God can fill, so there is no one that can, compl that can complete you. So that, that phrase doesn't really help. Well, what about this famous movie line? Love means never having to say you're sorry. Love means never having to say you're sorry. That sounds so romantic. Do you know, remember what movie that's from? It's from Love Story. But that, that uh, line also, my wife reminds me all the time, Lori reminds me that that is not true. Love actually means saying sorry when you've messed up. Or how about this, from one of the most famous movies uh, of all time, two, two romantic lines, we'll always have Paris, and here's looking at you, kid, you remember what movie that is? That's Casablanca, uh, one of the most famous movies of all time. And, uh, but that doesn't work if you've never been to, to Paris, I guess. But what if I told you that almost all of what you've learned about love from the movies, including Fly Me to the Moon, is half right at best and completely wrong most of the time? And see, we need to discover the truth about love because not only is it important to Understanding what love is, not only is that important to living a full life, but Jesus commands us to love one another. In fact, I want to show you our first verse. It's found in John chapter 13, verse 34. It's the words of Jesus. So I want to begin today by reading this out loud together. Um, uh, wherever you're joining us for church online in New York or in South Florida, I want you to read this with me, beginning with love. Are you ready? Go. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Jesus commands us. He says, love each other. Just as I've loved you, you should love each other. And so what is the truth about love? And how do we successfully uh, fulfill uh, Jesus' command here to love each other? Well, today, whether you're single or you're married, or maybe you're single again, I, I think you're going to find some life-changing truths about love. And my prayer is that, that when we're done here today, 
You're going to have a greater understanding of what the Bible says real love is. And then you're going to have a deeper commitment to be a better friend, a better spouse, a better parent, and a better Christian. Now, the best place to start to see what God says about love is in the Bible. So I want to begin with a word study on love. And I've put this in your notes. Because one of the reasons we have a hard time defining uh, the truth about love is because in the English language, we only have one word for love. And that word is love. And we use the word love to describe how we feel about a lot of things. For instance, I love God. I love my wife, Lori, and my kids. But I also love fried chicken. I love Diet Mountain Dew. I I love football. But I don't love them in in the same way. I I don't love fried chicken the same way that I love my kids. I I love fried chicken a lot more than my kids. I'm I'm just kidding. Most of the time I'm kidding. But you can see why defining the simple word love can be so confusing. It means so many different things. But In the New Testament of the Bible, it was originally written in Koine Greek. And while we only have one word for love in English, there there are at least four different Greek words that can be translated as love. And I want to show you these, the four Greek words for love. They have different depths and, and intensities of meaning. Here's the first one. It's the word philia. Philia. Now, there's an East Coast American city whose name comes from this Greek word for love. And, and, and I, th- I think you know it. Um, in, in New York, we hate their football team. It's, it's the city of Philadelphia. But philia, it means heartfelt affection. Write that in. Heartfelt affection. That's why Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. It's this heartfelt affection, this fondness for, for someone else. And this word philia is found in the, in the New Testament 31 times. This heartfelt uh, uh, affection. It's, it's a kind of love that close friends would have for one another. And then the second Greek word for love is storge, storge. And uh, you see that, and it means familial affection, familial affection. So uh, philia is heartfelt affection, the the love that friends would share. Then you get to familial affection, which is a little bit deeper. It's the love that you would have for your family. You're connected by blood and birth. You're born into a family. A mother would have a storge love for her child. It's a strong, enduring connection. Now, the third Greek word for love is the word eros. And I bet if you try hard enough, you can figure out what this eros love is. It's it's actually the root for the English word erotic. And eros is romantic sexual love. Write that in, romantic sexual love. It's the kind of love that creates the passion in, in, in the movie Fly Me to the Moon. And it's the only one of these Greek words. The rest of these are found in the New Testament. This is the only one of the Greek words not found in the Bible. But it does lead to our final Greek word for love. And that is agape. Agape. And agape is unconditional, godlike love. Unconditional, godlike love. The, the intensity of the love increases with each one of these. And then you got agape is un- unconditional, selfless, godlike love. It represents the kind of love that God has for us. And it represents the kind of love that God wants us to show to others as well. The Bible says agape love is a radical kind of love. And here's why. Agape love is loving when there's every reason not to love. It's loving another person when there's no benefit to loving them. It's loving another person when they don't deserve to be loved. And so for the rest of our time today, we're going to discover the truth about love by learning how to love one another better with agape love, with the same kind of love that God has for us. Now to guide us through uh, discovering what agape love really is, we're going to look at one of the most famous passages in the Bible on the topic of love. It's in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you've probably heard this chapter many times before. I almost know it by heart because I've read it so many times at at weddings I've officiated at. But I want us to uh, begin today by reading it out loud together. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 4 through 7 for our study of love today. But beginning in verse 4, let's read it together. Are you ready? Go. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. 
It is not irritable and it keeps no record of, of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So listen, using this, this passage as our guide, let's discover the truth about love. The truth about love uh, from 1 Corinthians 13. Here's the first truth about love. I want you to write this in. Love is a choice. Write that in. Love is a choice. Now, this truth goes completely against the popular notion that, that we see in rom-coms and movies that, that you fall in love with someone. I mean, think about that term. We use it all the time. I fell in love with her. I fell in love with him. You fall in love. And it sounds like you're walking down the street and you didn't notice a, a man cover had been removed and, and you just, uh, unbeknownst to you, just accidentally stepped in a manhole and your arms are flail, flailing and you're falling and you fall into love. You, you fall uncontrollably and there's no way to stop it. And you're like, ah, I fell. And that's how we talk about love. You didn't choose love. You fell into love. It wasn't your fault. And then once you fall in, you're, you're stuck. You can't help it, whether it's a good situation or not, whether it's with your, you fell in love with someone who points you to God or not. It's beyond your control because you fell in love. And if, if uh, the other thing that's dangerous about that, if I fall out of love, well, that's not my fault either. And I, I guess it means if I fall out of love, we should end our marriage or something like that. Look, you... Uh, you fall into a hole. You fall for a hoax, but you do not fall in love. You choose to love. You choose to spend time with somebody. You choose to invest in the relationship. You choose to act in a loving way towards them. Love is not a feeling that you fall into accidentally. It's a choice that leads to loving actions. Listen, and it's a big truth for every relationship you'll ever be in. Feelings follow actions. By the way, saying true love is a choice and that it's uh, not a feeling, that doesn't diminish love. It doesn't diminish the power of love. It elevates love because love isn't something that just happens to you. It's something that you choose. Love is a choice because it's careful. Love evaluates the feelings that you have, which oftentimes the feelings oftentimes come from a variety of different things, including lust. But you weigh your feelings against the biblical truth of love. You know, you evaluate the relationship with God's eyes and, and you step towards love when it's right or you step away from a situation if it doesn't honor God or if it's not healthy for you. That's why love is careful. Love is deliberate. It's a deliberate journey with another person towards God. But hear me, love is a choice. Henry David Thoreau said, Love must be as much a light as it is a flame. In other words, he's saying love has to be as much about substance as it is emotion. And let me just tell you this. True love doesn't happen in one instant. You know, once you're in love with someone, it's not one choice you make. You have to keep making that choice to love them every day moving forward. You know, many newly married couples, they don't understand this. They don't understand that love isn't just a choice that you make once and then it's taken care of. No. One of the big points of, of, of 1 Corinthians 13 is that love isn't a feeling and it isn't a one-time choice. It's a choice. Love is a choice you have to make again and again over and over every day of your life. Even when you don't feel like loving, you have to choose to do it. In fact, when I officiate a wedding, before a couple takes their vows, I'll always say, hey, this couple isn't just saying that they feel love for one another today. No, they are saying they are choosing to love one another today, and not just today, but they are saying they're going to choose to love one another every day for the rest of their lives, and that they're going to try to show that love in practical ways as well. And so listen, when you have a fight with your spouse or you have a disagreement with your parents, or you, even if you have to discipline one of your children, the question isn't, do you feel love for them? But the question is, are you going to choose to love them and then show that love to them through your actions in that moment? How do you choose to love someone every day through your practical actions? Well, going back to our passage in 1 Corinthians 13, we get some, we get a, a power, some powerful direction. 1 Corinthians 13 Verse 4, look at what it says. It says, love is, and I want you to underline or circle this word, patient. Love is patient and, what's that next word? Kind. Circle the word kind and patient. It says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful 
or proud or rude. You know, patience and kindness. I think those are two highly underrated choices you can make to show your love to someone that you care about. Patience and kindness have the power to transform any relationship. Let me just say this. It's not easy to be patient and kind to those who are closest uh, to you. In in fact, uh, the truth is most of us, we're kinder to strangers than we are to those that we say that we love the most. And that's why I believe your relationships with those closest to you will change dramatically if you will choose to follow these two, uh, these two commands, to be kind and to be patient with those in your life. So when you see your spouse for the first time at the end of the day, greet them, not with a demand, but greet them with a compliment. When your child messes up, instead of snapping at them, correct them with patience and kindness. Now, looking back at this verse, let's not forget, that not only do we show patience and kindness, but we need to remove jealousy, boastfulness, pride, and rudeness as well. If you get those out of your relationship, that will definitely help. But here's the point. Love is not based on emotions. Emotions, they waver and they fade. Love is a choice you make over and over again through the actions that you take. And so the first truth about love we learned from 1 Corinthians 13, love is a choice. Here's the the second truth about love. Love is a compromise. Write that in. Love is a compromise. You know, love is learning to be less selfish and and to give up the uh, my way or the highway type thinking. You know, the comedian Rita Rudner once said, I love being married. It's so great to find that one special person you want to annoy for the rest of your life. And see, I think there's a lot of truth in that because every couple is going to disagree. Every couple is going to fight. Every couple is going to get on each other's nerves. You're going to annoy one another. There's always going to be conflict. And let me just say, in any relationship, that's why compromise is so important because there's no such thing as a conflict-free relationship. By the way, there's no such thing as a conflict-free church because a church is a family made up of relationships. And so there's always conflict that, that's present. You know, some of the best advice I was given about my marriage was this. Uh, I was told, Carrick, you can be right or you can be happy, but you can't be both. See, if you have to win every battle, I can guarantee you that you won't be happy. You're going to be fighting and you're going to be miserable for the rest of your life, for the entire relationship. You know, C.S. Lewis, um, the, the great Christian theologian of the last century, said that pride is the ultimate source of all sin. That pride is the ultimate source of all sin. And it's because pride, it, it causes, causes us to cling to our rights. Pride causes us to demand that we have things our way. Pride is the root cause of every conflict in the history of the world. Whether it's two friends getting into an argument or two nations getting into a war, pride is the root. Our pride is the source of our conflict. In fact, look at what 1 Corinthians 13 says about letting go of our pride. We're in verses 5 and 6. It says this, Love does not demand its own way. Underline that phrase. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. You see, love can't exist where pride is in control because you can't choose to love someone if you're only thinking about yourself and what you want. Love can only be present when you stop just thinking about what you want and you start thinking about the other person when you let go of your pride. And so learn to give a little. Learn to compromise. Learn to listen and care about what the other person needs even before you consider your own needs. But let me give you one note here. In a loving relationship, compromise isn't always 50-50. You know, sometimes compromise looks more like 100-0. You say, well, that's not compromise, but sometimes it is. Let me explain. If something is really important to my wife, Lori, but it's only sort of important to me, it doesn't matter as much to me, on the emotional scale of importance, it's up here for her and it's down here for me, then loving godly compromise in that situation isn't 50-50. I mean, how prideful would I have to be to make her meet me halfway on something that means so much more to her? Now, if it's more important to her, if it's, you know, hey, what's the color of the couch going to be when I'm colorblind or what kind of lamp are we going to get? If it's something that's more important to her, out of love, I should compromise by letting her make the decision. And guess what? If I do that, if I show her love and compromise, 
a hundred zero when it's important to her, guess what? She's going to be more likely when something is more important to me to let me make the decision and to compromise a hundred zero with me when I show her that kind of love. By the way, if you're looking for love and you're dating someone right now who never compromises, who never puts you before themselves and, and they always have to have their way, that's not a good sign. That's a warning flag. Love is a choice. And love is a compromise because love is not prideful. Now, here's the third truth about love. Write this in. Love is unconditional. Write that in. Love is unconditional. See, true love is unconditional. And the agape love we talked about earlier, it is the exact opposite of conditional love. Now, when I say love is unconditional... I mean that love isn't subject to circumstances. It's not subject to a good mood or a bad mood. It's not subject to a a, a tough situation you're going through. I mean that you choose to love despite the circumstances. I I choose to love you despite your faults. I I love you through uh, all things and at all times. That's unconditional love. I love you through all things and at all times. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 describes it this way, going back into the love chapter. It says, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. I'm going to repeat that verse one more time, and I want you to really listen to the words. This is what true love is, unconditional love. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Listen, that that is a perfect picture of God's love for you and me. God's love for you isn't dependent on you. It's not dependent on what you've done. It's not dependent on you being a good person before God is going to love you. No, God's love is a picture of who God is. It reveals His perfect character. Let me just tell you this. There's nothing that you can do that would make God ever love you more. And there's nothing you can do that would make God ever love you less. You don't have to earn God's love because God's love isn't based on what you do. It's based on God's perfect character, who He is. In other words, you can't lose God's love because you didn't earn it in the first place. It's not about you. It's about who God is, and God is love. He loves you unconditionally. And get this, because God loves you unconditionally, did you know that you can, when you receive that love, you can learn to love others unconditionally in your own life? I mean, what does that look like? What is that kind of human love? What is unconditional love? Because we're not God, we're not perfect. But what does unconditional love look like in, from a human perspective? Well, in his book, Mortal Lessons, Richard Selzer, a noted surgeon, shared a lesson that he learned from one of his patients. And in this book, I want to share with you what, what he wrote. He wrote these words. He said, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. The young woman speaks, will my mouth always be like this, she asks. Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and I am so close I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers, to show her that their kiss still works. Yeah, I think this story is so powerful because it's the kind of love that we all want to receive from another person, the unconditional love. But it's so hard because it's so hard to give this kind of unconditional love to another person. It's a love that is unconditional, not dependent on circumstances. It's the kind of love that doesn't turn its back on a family member who's hateful and destructive because they can't kick an addiction. It's the kind of love that doesn't give up on a marriage even though you're going through a hard time and it feels hopeless and you don't feel love for the other person. It's the kind of love that never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Now, one thing you need to understand is you can't give this kind of love to another person until you first experience this kind of love in your own life, which leads to our final biblical truth about love. Write this in. Love is demonstrated by Jesus Christ. 
love is demonstrated by Jesus Christ. The truth is, you can't discover the truth about love from the movies because what you see on the screen isn't real love. See, Jesus is the only one who fully exemplified what real love is. Jesus modeled perfect agape love in his life and in his death. I mean, I want you to think of all the situations where Jesus showed genuine unconditional true love towards others, an unconditional love that wasn't dependent on what other people did. See, Jesus loved others unconditionally over and over again. See, Jesus showed unconditional love to Peter, even after Peter denied knowing who Jesus was three times during the most significant moment in Jesus' life. Jesus showed unconditional love to Judas. He loved Judas even though he knew Judas was going to betray him to death. Jesus showed unconditional love to the Samaritan woman at the well. Even though he wasn't supposed to speak with her by law, he still showed love to her. Jesus showed unconditional love to the adulterer who who was caught and others wanted to stone because she committed adultery. I could go on and on of all the times Jesus exhibited this perfect, unconditional, agape love. In every instance, he did. And the culmination of his unconditional love, the ultimate example of his agape love for us, is found on the cross where Jesus died for our sins, where he took upon himself the punishment we deserved. He took it upon himself so that we could be saved. 1 John 3.16 says this, we know what real love is. How do we know what real love is? Because Jesus gave up his life for us. The perfect picture of love is the cross what we see on the cross. This is the kind of love that we want to receive. It's the kind of love that we should want to give. But let me introduce you to a very important principle. It's called the principle of experiential love. It's the principle of experiential love. And the principle of experiential love says this, you can't love until you've been loved. And then you can only love to the extent to which you've been loved. Now, let me me repeat that. It's the principle of experiential love. You can't love until you've been loved, and then you can only love according to how much you've been loved. Let me say it another way. The amount of love you can give is dependent on the amount of love you have received because it's impossible for you to give something that you've never received in your own life. And this is why it's so important. It is so important for your, every relationship you're ever in. It's so important that you open up your heart to God's love. Because it's only when you experience the unconditional agape love of Jesus that you can then, in turn, give that kind of unconditional agape love to the people in your life. Even if in your past other people haven't loved you the way that you deserve to be loved, if you open your heart to Jesus, if you receive His love into your life, you can can then begin to be healed and you can begin to love other people in the same way that Jesus has loved you. Our memory verse for this week, it's the words of Jesus from John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It's our memory verse, so I want us to read this out loud together, beginning with for this. Are you ready? Read it with me. Go. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. You see, our world is trying to define what love is for us. In the movies, in, in movies like Fly Me to the Moon, they're trying to define what real love is. And, and the world's going to try to show you what it is. And sometimes, even in the movies, we'll get a small glimpse of love. But God is love. And it is God who has defined and perfectly modeled what real love is. Love is a choice, love is a compromise. Love is is unconditional, and love is demonstrated perfectly by Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a final question. Will you allow God's love as demonstrated through Jesus Christ to fill your heart today? For those of you who are already followers of Jesus, you're a Christian, that may mean just remembering today, taking time to pause and remember what Jesus did for you on the cross and just recommitting your life to Him, reconnecting and returning to God's love that first saved you. For others of you, it may mean today is the day for you to turn your life over to God for the first time. Deciding to follow Jesus who demonstrated how much he loves you by giving his life for you on the cross. Listen, if today 
you're ready to experience God's love for the first time in a personal way, I want to encourage you to say yes to becoming a follower of Jesus. In fact, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now as we pray. So wherever you're joining me uh, for church online right now, if you would, bow your head, close your eyes, and, and let's go to God in prayer right now. If you would, bow your heads. Father, we thank you for your agape love, your unconditional love for us. Thank you that even in our sin and our brokenness, even when we, we turned our backs on you, you loved us anyway. God, help us to remember these biblical truths about love, to choose to love even when it's difficult, to be patient and kind, to choose to compromise, to love unconditionally, and to look to Jesus to see a perfect model of what love is. Father, I especially want to pray for those who have never experienced your love. And I, I pray if they need to take that step, if they need to cross the line and say yes to Jesus today, if that's you, I invite you to pray with me right now. And I want you to pray what I'm praying. Pray these words silently in your heart as I pray them out loud. And I want you to believe these words as you pray them. If you're ready, just pray the simple prayer. If you're ready to get right with God. Father, I know I'm a sinner. But today, I want to experience your love for the first time. I want to know you personally. Today, I say yes to Jesus. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose from the dead. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Today, I choose to follow you as my leader and my Lord, as a part of your church from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.